presentation. Uh, my name is Henrietta Wilson. I'm really pleased to be here today. I do freelance research on weapons of mass destruction disarmament, and I'm really delighted to have a chance to work with Dan Plesch and Olamide Samuel uh, from the SOAS team on this. And I need to give a special thanks to all the scrap volunteers that have helped with this, and a special shout out to Anant Saria, Julia Alten Brinker, and Ruth Einersdottir. So thank you all very much for your help making this all happen. Um, I'm delighted we've got some fantastic panellists today. We have Jamie Withorn from the James Martin Centre for Non-Proliferation Studies. We have Eric Toller, Toller from Bellingcat and Richard Guthrie from CBW Events. Um, a really exciting set of insights and experiences from different open source projects. Um, uh, before I hand over to them, I'm going to give some overviews about what all these webinars are about um, and to fill you in on some of the themes that we've had in previous webinars. So we had two webinars in July and when I finished giving my opening talks, I will post the links to the recordings of those uh, that are on the SOAS YouTube channel. Um, but to recap on some important definitions, by open source verification, what we're meaning is any tracking that uses publicly available tools and information. So some of this, as we saw in the July webinars, is really what you might call high tech. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, I, there's, a, there's a complication in using these words, but some of it involving satellites and AI and automated processing tools, and some of it isn't. Some of it is much more people driven, um, that's looking at information from traditional media sources like newspapers or broadcasts. But underpinning all of this is the internet. Uh, and the internet really enables and facilitates information uh, in itself and also the tools to process the information. And the internet also really facilitates communications. Um, and so enables communities of practitioners in different places in the world to come together uh, and track things in different remote spots. So this open source sort of stuff is happening in many different places and in many different ways. So I've been talking to a whole bunch of people. Uh, there are people in traditional media places like the New York Times, there are people uh, in different research groups in think tanky sort of places or universities. Um, there are practitioners on the ground, isolated ways, and also governments are doing this sort of work. Um, so a whole bunch of stuff. So one aim for these webinars was really to capture some of that variety uh, and the differences that's going on. And also to start developing conversations around the possibilities and the challenges of this sort of work. So for an example, in our July webinars, we featured people who have been monitoring political violence or small arms flows through Africa or radioactive materials in Somalia, as well as signs of illicit nuclear proliferation. We also had analysts talking about general insights uh, about the relevance, the contributions this sort of work might make to global governance structures or other uh, systems. So I'm now just going to share uh, uh, my screen. One thing I wanted to flag up in these opening comments is through the different webinars we've had so far and through some of my wider research conversations, is that there are some common emerging themes which I might actually classify as questions. It's unclear to the, the extent to which the, the, these are relevant or universal considerations. So it feels very much to me as though in principle, the new technologies that I quickly overviewed do make possible some element of global tracking, whether that's tracking disease or shipping flows or all sorts of different sectors, new technologies are making a difference in the possible scale of monitoring work that's going on. But there are some massive challenges in that, in, in thinking about global systems, 
it's clear that there's a really uneven playing field. There's very different uh, access to the technologies that you need or the skills you need to make those technologies work or the structures that enable you to do this, the social and political structures. There's also big differences in attitudes and practices in how people are conducting this work, including things like attitudes towards privacy protection, attitudes towards law on who owns data. Uh, and there's also a sense that despite the fact that lots of these technologies uh, uh, and methods enhance the visibility um, of, of different practices, different artifacts, um, not everything is visible. There's still areas where there could be murkiness. On the other hand, despite those challenges, it's also clear that verification has been, often is pivotal to the implementation of global governance structures, including international treaties designed to regulate different weapon systems. Uh, and even if the existing technologies are imperfectly visible, it's still better to have some sort of enhanced visibility. And that this, the, the promise is that it could feed into supporting different structures. Uh, and it also seems that technologies can have a role above and beyond their technological component. Um, so when there's real friction in political conversations or negotiations on the multilateral front, the conversations around technologies and their possibilities can really stimulate wider political engagement. So those are just a couple of thoughts for me. It's very much work in progress, but I wanted to frame this event in terms of um, some of the things uh, that I've been finding out. So I'll just briefly say a bit about how this event is going to work. We're going to have three short talks um, from uh, Jamie Withorn, uh, Eric Toller and Richard Guthrie. Um, and throughout those, I invite everybody to post comments or questions via the chat and I'll be monitoring that uh, throughout the session um, and putting the questions or comments to the panelists. Um, the, this event is being recorded and will be published uh, later on. Um, and the presentation parts of the event will finish at 3 p.m. Uh, after that, in response to feedback from previous events, um, we're, going, we're, we're leaving this space open for half an hour for an optional breakout discussion. Um, now, some people I know will need to leave at that point, and so I will flag up, flag up at three o'clock that we're changing mode and, and enable people to leave if they want, but please do feel, feel free to stay if you want to. So thank you very much for being here, everybody, and uh, I'm now going to hand over to Jamie for her talk. Uh, thank you. Yes, so I'm just going to share my screen. All right, hi everybody. Um, my name is Jamie Withhorn. I'm a research assistant at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies. And today I'll be speaking specifically about open source information and how it relates to nonproliferation issues. Um, so before we begin, I'd like to kind of define some terms. I know Henrietta led with some definitions. However, I think I'm, it's best for me to kind of describe to you all how I approach open source information analysis. And so the first thing is that I view open source information um, as a research framework and a methodology as opposed to a specific type of source. And so when I speak about open source information, I'm really referring to a process of, you know, data collection and analysis in the open source realm. Um, to that end, it's also important to define data and information. So data is, you know, the smallest building block of a fact and information is layered or structured data that can help paint a better picture. And so um, for most of this, even if I use the term or the acronym OSINT, which stands for open source intelligence, I'm actually probably really referring to information. Um, and why that is, is because intelligence is a very, very specific term that refers to kind of an assessment of potential adversary behavior and what it, you know, might do or might kind of what consequences it might have. And while so some of that degree is covered in general kind of nonproliferation open source um, analysis, a large part of it is actually more so just information, who's doing what and how. And next, I'll also define the term evidence, as I think that sometimes is thrown around. Evidence uh, refers to information that is admissible in court. And so 
throughout my research process, I often try to refrain from using this phrase as well is because I don't think necessarily that what I'm finding would be admissible in court. Um, so again, all that to say is that when I say OSINT, I'm generally speaking about a process and I'm generally speaking about information. Um, in the open source process, I think it's really important to differentiate also between techniques and methodologies versus tools. And so what I mean by that are there are tools um, or kind of single use applications. So, for example, you can go to a website and be like, this website will pull the user information from this one particular website. And while that can be useful, I think it's much better to understand how that that tool is functioning or what uh, methodology or technique that tool is applying in order to apply that to different case studies. Um, and so oftentimes a lot of, you know, satellite imagery analysis, a lot of those principles are founded in uh, GIS or like kind of earth sciences studies. And those are, can be really useful to understand the underlying methodologies to apply it to a non-proliferation framework. So again, um, that's a really an integral step, I think. Next, I'll just kind of briefly define the process of open source um, analysis. I think the first step is exploring uh, your sources, seeing what's publicly available and what is available to you. Um, and the next step is collecting. I think in collection, you should cast a wide net and gather basically everything you can um, that you think might in some way, shape or form begin to answer your question. Um, and then the next step is processing. So kind of going through your data and information and making it understandable to humans and kind of help it begin to tell its story. And then lastly is the, uh, the analysis part where you're kind of going through your information your structured information and understanding um, how it begins to answer your question or what questions still remain after you've kind of conducted this entire process. Um, and then the final step, I guess, is reporting or publishing or presenting your work. And there are some ethical considerations there, especially in the non-proliferation realm. Um, you know, you don't want to accidentally create a WMD shopping list for bad actors. And so kind of understanding how um, and where to publish your findings is important. Um, it's also important throughout this entire process to have uh, peer reviews to make sure others are kind of uh, understanding your chain of thought and your kind of analysis and either are in agreement or helping you to realize where you could kind of uh, push your hypothesis a bit further. Um, so next I'll speak more specifically about non-proliferation applications. Um, so I know this is, you know, called uh, verification in the age of Google Earth, but satellite imagery and which is Google Earth is really only one type or form of open source information. Um, so there are a bunch of different kinds of open source information that when piled together or when used together can actually help paint a better kind of, you know, uh, picture, I guess. And so satellite imagery is one of those, which is again, satellite imagery taken from satellites. There's also ground imagery or imagery that's quite literally taken from the ground. So actors on the ground who are then publishing those pictures to um, social media. So that can be useful in, you know, helping to define weapons dimensions. Um, that's like a really interesting aspect of potential uh, non-proliferation applications like ground imagery. Um, however, corporate information is also super important. So understanding corporate entities and their networks. So um, who they're related to, who they're trading with, what they're importing, what they're exporting, how they're doing it, who the beneficial owner of that corporate entity um, helps begin to kind of assess non-proliferation in terms of mainly like, you know, export control and sanctions, but it can also pertain or paint a better picture of potential proliferation concerns in the corporate realm. Next is transportation data. Um, I think often this is overlooked in um, a non or excuse me, open source analysis. However, it is extremely beneficial to understand how items of potential proliferation concern are moving from one country to the next or another. And so, um, here I've listed planes and um, boats, which are the kind of main transportation mechanism for proliferation related goods. Um, and so it can be really useful to better understand how uh, these, uh, I guess, entities transmit data. And I'll go through a case study in a second on um, vessels specifically. And lastly, I, I think it's important to include text because uh, it's not as fun as satellite imagery perhaps. However, it, it does provide a kind of a very uh, important foundational context and understanding of what's going on and where and kind of what the primary sources say versus, you know, comparing and contrasting different sources to better um, suss out what's fact and what's more author assessment. 
So next, I'll go into two case studies very briefly. Um, the first is on North Korea and sanctions evasion tactics. So North Korea is designated by the United Nations, um, and this limits their import and export, um, excuse me, it limits their ability to either import or export coal and oil. And so in order to evade these sanctions, North Korea often relies on vessels or boats and tries to kind of uh, spoof the data in a couple of ways. The first um, is kind of more traditional AIS spoofing. So AIS refers to automatic information system transponders. And essentially it's the data that um, is what a boat tells other boats where it is. Um, so it's really important to have on so as to not you know, crash. Um, in AIS spoofing, what happens is uh, the boat's IMO or MMSI, which is like its unique identifiers are manipulated. So it looks like it's a different boat. So sometimes North Korea will spoof it and be like, oh, this is not my vessel. It's actually a Fiji vessel going into the, the East China Sea. When in reality, it is actually a North Korean tanker going to conduct a ship to ship transfer. So understanding kind of how it's manipulating its AIS or spoofing it there. Another way um, North Korea will do that is simply just turning off its data. So a lack of data is sometimes data in and of itself or information in and of itself. So um, for example, my colleagues uh, did a fantastic study on the Taeyang where uh, this vessel was going into port in Nampo in North Korea. Um, but once it was past the barrage, it just turned off its AIS. Um, and using satellite imagery, they were able to identify the vessel and they were able to spot it unloading coal. And so again, that kind of paint, that speaks to the importance of relying on more than one source or one type of uh, open source information. Next, I'll just speak very briefly about a, a traditional kind of geolocation case study I kind of uh, ducted. Um, so earlier in, or back in 2019, the US Department of State released a report on chemical weapons uh, compliance in Myanmar. Um, and in the report, they released this one picture um, providing the image provider and the date and all it said was near Tombow. So using those three pieces of information, again, near Tombow, the date of the picture, and then um, the provider of the image, I went to Image Hunter, kind of found the area of interest, overlaid that onto Google Earth, and then was able to find um, this potential, this exact facility. And so um, what this does is kind of helps us to better understand compliance, not necessarily from a uh, you know, enforcement uh, way, but in from a monitoring lens, I suppose. So we're able to kind of assess, is there activity at these buildings? Are there vehicles? Are there, is there smoke? Do these buildings or facilities look like they can produce chemical weapons? If, um, if the you know, State Department says so, perhaps these can be other models for chemical weapons development in smaller states. So again, it provides a lot of information um, without monitoring and potential you know, future analysis lens. Um, and I know I'm running short on time, so I'll just briefly wrap up and talk a little bit about the future of open source intelligence. Um, uh, just going back to Henrietta's opening, I think that as emerging technologies continue to advance, so too will open source information um, analysis, the ability kind of uh, to go through large amounts of big data um, faster and more efficiently and yield better results, I think will um, also pertain to open source information um, and kind of streamlining those analyses. Um, I also think that there's going to kind of, as emerging tech continues to improve or involve, I think that um, there's going to be new mediums and new forms of data that are going to help uh, open source information analysis and kind of help paint, again, more complete pictures. And so well, by new mediums or forms, I mean everything from like TikToks and memes to using radio transponders on boats instead of ASI or using um, SAR, which is radar instead of satellite for a better imagery. And so that's, I think, um, one positive we can look forward to in the open source realm. And then I briefly mentioned this earlier, but I think ethics or code of conduct or kind of a standard operating procedure slash a due diligence process in open source analysis as it pertains to nonproliferation is particularly important to develop as, um, again, you don't want to be publishing sensitive material on like how to make a nuclear weapon. That's not good. And so kind of understanding the, the ramifications of publication, I think, um, will be a useful tool. So with that, I will wrap up um, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Jamie, thank you very, very much. What an amazing amount you fit into a short time. I'm really fascinated by uh, the range of, uh, of information you gave us about 
what you're doing, the, the things that you're using, how you, how you think about them in, in your head, uh, and also the sense that part of your overall project is consideration of how you disseminate things, uh, and that you're not just creating, generating findings for the sake of it, there's a real mindfulness of a political purpose in there. Um, I'd be really interested to hear you talk more about that at some stage. I'm also really interested in the example you gave of how your open source work was, enabled, was, was able to spot North Korean spoofing of systems that was meant to be complying with. And why I'm particularly interested to pick you up on that is uh, in the first webinar, there was conversation about how misinformation and disinformation makes uh, all sorts of tracking, monitoring, uh, much harder because you have an extra job to distinguish real from unreal information. But the example you gave showed that open source is really can be really powerful at identifying those sorts of things. Do you think that sort of insight is generalizable in any way or is that a bit of a reach? I, I think it's generalizable, but I don't want to kind of, you know, overstate um, our analysis. So even though we were able to catch this discrepancy, we always try and caveat it by saying that it may be doing this because we, we don't know for sure. And it, there could be multiple factors um, in, in the waters that are affecting potential, you know, discrepancies in the AIS transmission data. There can also be data aggregation errors on the side of your supplier. So who is providing us with the AIS information? And that can also kind of, you know, be a little mis- leading. And so while it, we are pretty kind of confident in this assessment that these two vessels happen to be in the same place at the same time, and they might potentially are using the same kind of information uh, in, uh, identifiers, it's really important to not overstate that. And so like, we're not necessarily recommending in any capacity to sanction this vessel, but rather we're saying this is something that could be of value in future analysis to kind of continue to monitor. I see, and there's, a, there's an understanding there that maybe the, your findings need to be understood in a certain context too. Uh, so that's really, that's really helpful to hear, yeah. So I'm going to pause my other questions for you. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much, Jamie. Um, I'm going to invite now uh, Arik uh, Toller from Bellingcat to, to give his presentation. Um, thank you, and we'll come back to Jamie later as well. Sure. So I have my screen up now. You can see it fine, right? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great. Okay, good deal. So um, I'm with Bellingcat. Um, my name's Eric. I'm in Kansas City over in the U.S. I'm Bellingcat, which is an organization that focuses on um, digital evidence as uh, investigative raw materials, I guess you could say, if I'm going to keep my um, metaphors going with the mining thing. So I'm uh, going to talk a little bit today um, in my short 10 minutes about um, a, a case study and a broader theme um, about um, digital investigation um, regarding incidents in the war in the Donbass, which is a fancy way of saying Eastern Ukraine. Um, so the war is still going, but it doesn't really get any headlines anymore. But um, the war broke out in spring 2014, and it's still going today. Though, of course, the hottest periods were in the summer of 2014 and the early winter of 2015, but it's still kind of simmering around still. So in particular, the most, I guess, infamous and horrible um, incident within the war was the downing of MH17, which was the Malaysian um, airliner that was shot down on July 17th, 2014, over eastern Ukraine, um, killed 298 people. And the trials, uh, majority of the citizens who died were Dutch because it was at Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur flight. And the trial is going on right now at, um, in The Hague. Um, and this is a, a very nice and neat, well, not nice and neat, but it's, it's very messy, but it's, it's a very illustrative, illustrative case study of looking at new forms of digital materials and digital, um, I don't want to be too, I, I want to be a little bit more careful with the words I use. So digital evidence you can use possibly for the current court case. Um, um, as we heard in the last presentation, it's the word choice could be very loaded depending on um, the context. But um, what this is a very interesting case because uh, as compared to things like the Lockerbie bombing, you know, back in the 80s over um, over the United Kingdom, um, I mean, there wasn't a whole lot there, right? I mean, the, it blew up over the sky, I think over Scotland, right? Um, and, you know, there's a long trial and eventually some people were charged um, and then later released. Um, both MX-17, we have we have everything. I mean, we have dash cam videos, which is the one you're watching right now to the side. We have um, uh, photographs, videos, witness accounts from the participants, people who actually were involved in the um, 
in the convoy the transporting the weapon, this is about non-proliferation, but transporting the weapon that shot down the plane eventually. And uh, a lot of information from locals as well for what they saw. They saw a missile trail, they saw um, a convoys of missile, uh, missile launcher moving through the um, center of town and all sorts of other um, horrible things. So I'm just gonna give a kind of a brief outline of the um, process of collecting this evidence, um, verifying it, making sure it's real and also analyzing it um, and keeping it somewhat um, sorted. So, um, the user generated content with this is uh, very, very, very important. So user generated content is a really fancy way of saying photos and videos from, from people. So things are uploaded into YouTube, um, Twitter, Facebook, um, Instagram, but also regional social networks like Kontakty uh, and Anaklasniki, which are Russian language networks that are very popular in Eastern Ukraine. So here are a couple of video, uh, photos in uh, particular. One was taken by a journalist um, or a stringer who was driving by. On the right, you can see this big green monster on the back of a truck. That's the missile launcher they downed uh, MH17. In the left, you see the same uh, big green monster um, kind of parked along the road um, with a minivan and a uh, back of a white car that's visible too. Now these two photos look like there's not, not a whole lot going on, but um, they're, uh, if we, um, we could spend um, a two hour webinar just talking about these, these two photos and all the little tiny details you can extract from them. So for example, on the left photo, um, you can figure out, okay, there's, it's a three lane road because you can see that there's a, there's a car in each of those lanes and they're all facing the same direction, which means it's probably a one way road, which means it's a, and you see a green area behind it. So that means that if we were to kind of extrapolate the um, urban uh, landscape of this, you can see it's a three lane, one way road heading one way which means on the other side of those trees you see behind the big green monster is probably another three lane road heading the opposite direction. So it's like a parkway or boulevard or whatever the urban um, architecture or city planning term is. And there's not a whole lot of these throughout Eastern Ukraine, which is a development, uh, developmentally, um, I guess, regressed area um, from the war and um, lack of um, infrastructure. So you can find this area relatively quickly just by cruising up and down Google Earth and um, Google Maps, just based on that one little fact alone. But these are all user generated um, content. They were just taken by people who, who took them and then sent them to the investigation or uploaded them online. Um, again, the big, big departure from the Lockerbie case, some other cases too. But this was actually in, this is in Eastern Ukraine. This is from the hours, this, both these taken uh, photos were taken about seven hours before the shoot down in the actual, near the location of the shoot down in Eastern Ukraine. Well, that's not worth thinking. This thing didn't appear at a, um, at a thin air. Uh, it was in um, Russia before it was in um, uh, Ukraine. And there are also videos and photos from normal people in Russia. Again, Ukraine doesn't have a monopoly on dash cam videos and cell phone cameras. Um, in Russia, you have just as many. And so um, there's a gigantic convoy that was moving from the uh, Russian city of Kursk. If you know anything about World War II, you know about Kursk, uh, down to the Ukrainian border and eventually across the border into the eventual um, launch site for uh, where the Malaysian airliner was downed. And this is the convoy that took about three days to get reach from Kursk down to the border. And during that time, um, there were about um, 20 or so photos and videos that were uploaded on Instagram, YouTube, Russian social networks, um, local and regional groups, of people showing this convoy. Again, they weren't saying like, oh my God, look, this thing is gonna shoot down a plane. It's really just, you know, you're driving to work and you see this big, this convoy of 20 tanks drive by, you know, you go home, you upload it to YouTube, you get 500 views on the video and you, know, you feel good about yourself or whatever. Um, and, but no one was uploading these thinking like, you know, I'm a, I'm a spy, I, you know, I'm seeing these things, I'm reporting enemy troop movements, whatever. No, it's, you're going to work, you see something weird, right? So you upload a video of it. Same way as people upload videos of, you know, those ring door, um, door cams, right? Of things like funny things that happen outside. This is now um, turned into an actual case um, with the joint investigation team, which is the Dutch led team um, that's doing the criminal investigation to the trial um, of the downing. And a lot of these um, suspects, there's only four suspects who have been charged currently, but there's a lot more brewing um, in the background. And a lot of the, uh, the eventual uh, conclusions about who's guilty um, came from this user generated content. So photos and videos from the ground that helped us identify the exact weapon that was used because every um, missile launcher is kind of unique in its own way. It has you know, certain dents and scratch marks and paint swatches and, you know, even like the wiring of the cables on there are a certain alignment 
that you can then cross-reference between the stuff that you see in Ukraine and then the same photos and videos you see from ordinary citizens in Russia, but also the participants of the war too. So in the top right, you see a bunch of lads uh, with their arms, you know, hanging out and posing in front of a missile launcher. You know, these are a bunch of um, Russian conscripts and contract soldiers, you know, in the early 20s, you know, you joined, the, just like in the U.S. here, you know, you may be from a small town, you join the military, you go all around the world and blow stuff up, then you post photos online to, you know, make your friends back home jealous of seeing all the cool things you're doing. Well, they did the same things with this missile launcher, um, which was really good investigative materials for us. And of course, in the bottom, if you're really interested in the case, you recognize some of these faces uh, of people who were um, also involved in the war between the Russian military intelligence and military itself. So this is just kind of goes towards the um, democratization of information that, um, again, that's kind of a buzzword people always use, but here it's, it's shown in a very, um, very discreet case of how um, it's not just, you know, people on the ground who are interviewing people and gathering information and doing criminal, like official criminal investigations who can piece together what happened. You know, this, if we had this during the Lockerbie case, if we had this during, um, I don't know, uh, whatever big, big name event you want to think of, there could be more information out there. And of course, possibly more disinformation and misinformation too to piece together exactly what happened. I mean, we've seen this with 9-11, you can see all the stuff with you know, all the truthers and loose change and all those about how they kind of misinterpret um, information too. So this is not entirely a good thing because more information also means more um, misinterpretations of information too. But in this case, specifically the MiG-17, it, um, it was a very good uh, case to see how all this information on the ground can, um, provided people who just with 3G internet connection can provide, so allows us to piece together um, exactly who's guilty of the deaths of these 298 people. I think I'm probably about out of time, but um, if you, I'm sending these slides to everyone too, if you're really interested in this kind of stuff, if you're kind of a nerd for the Eastern Ukraine and information spaces and all that stuff, I put together a brief survey of the, of the information landscape of the war and about how, if you want to gather information about the war, where do you go? So where are both um, normal people who live in the conflict zone. This is, for example, from Instagram. Some, they were, some soldier was sitting with a gun. In the US, this is normal, but in Eastern Ukraine, apparently it's not. Um, some guy sitting with a gun holstered in the bus and they were kind of talking about like, oh my God, you know, this guy, he's a gun in the gun, you know, has a gun in the bus. And everyone's like, oh, it's fine. He's, he's a soldier, it's okay. Um, and because maybe there's later a shootout with this guy involved, we, you know, we have this photo and video. Um, Telegram, um, crowdsource information as well. So if you're into this, you know, YouTube, which, can, which are uploaded by the participants of the war um, and um, also the observers of it too. So uh, if you're really interested in this topic, um, I provide a brief survey at the end of the slides. I don't have to, you know, we need about two hours to get through all this. Um, if you're interested in um, how to conduct research in the modern, you know, get the only, um, the only European war to be conducted with massive amount of, inf of internet available and how um, the information landscape is completely different than pretty much every war we've seen um, in Europe outside of you know, Syria and Libya. Okay, I, th I think I, that's 10 minutes, right? You wanna make sure I didn't yeah, go yeah, way sure, over time. Sorry, okay, I'm, good, I'm sorry. just unmuting in a particularly incompetent sure, way. Sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. I mean, yeah, no problem. I'm really, um, Arik has also shared his slides with me and we'll be posting them to participants afterwards. Um, I'm really excited to go through them a bit more carefully myself. I, I really enjoyed uh, your presentation, Eric, in that sense of you, show, you showed us the opportunities that are available in these sorts of, of projects from start to finish in the project uh, in the Ukraine. And, you know, the, you, unlike, you got some information and you, unlike, and you showed us the sorts of information that was all fascinating. What it made me wonder was how you decide what, what data flows to follow, <laughs> how you mm -hmm. decide there's something to look at and if, you know, I appreciate you might not be able to give a, a, a long answer to this um, or, or, or a pithy answer, but is there a sense that you have any understanding of things that you might be missing mm -hmm. or is it kind of spontaneous serendipitous occurrences? Uh, yeah, it depends. I mean, there's two different questions here. One is um, the selection of what to research in the first place. And the second mm -hmm. is um, once you do decide to research something, what, what, do, you, what do you gather and what do you ignore? So the selection in the first place is really driven by interests and also just once you do this for a while, you kind of get a sixth sense for like what can be researchable and what isn't, you know, based on what um, kind of an incident, like where would you actually have somewhere where um, you do have massive spread of, of internet connection and internet literacy where people actually be sharing photos and videos and witness accounts of an event. 
versus somewhere where it's a little bit tougher. So with the example with the Navalny poisoning that everyone's talking about in the news now, that's not quite so fertile for, um, for investigation just because it's a guy who um, ingested poison at some point and we don't really know when or where and you can't really see poison on a Instagram photo, right? So it's not really good for this, but you can see a giant missile launcher moving through the middle of the town. Um, and then once you do decide to research something, it's, uh, it's really just about collecting as much as you possibly can and also doing as quickly as you can too. So we saw this with the downing of the um, Ukrainian airliner in um, outside of Tehran. So that was actually, that was in, believe it or not, that was in 2020, that was in January, I think. It feels like it was five years ago. Yeah, so that it, it was technically this year and how when we were doing it and, and we were we collecting information about that witness accounts, videos and photos, we did as fast as we possibly could just because um, as we saw with MX-17 case, people would post a witness account to a local telegram group or a local group on um, VK, which is a Russian language network. And they would post it thinking only people are reading this are other locals because people are much more honest and forthcoming when they talk in local and hyper local groups, like even like neighborhood groups. And then once they realize that, you know, me, some guy sitting in Kansas City um, is looking at their message, they realize, oh, I probably um, shouldn't have this out in the open and they may delete things. So the real challenge is not so much about being um, choosy and selective and picky about what you research, but really about collecting as much as you possibly can in the early stages before stuff disappears into the ether of the internet, um, before it can be archived or saved away. So that's that's more often the challenge is um, trying to do, you know, there's no such thing as completely comprehensive data analysis unless you have like the NSA like pipeline to the whole internet or whatever. Um, but for everyone else, um, yeah, you have to just be um, very quick and go to where, you know, again, if you know the area, if you, I, I don't know anything about um, Iran, I don't know, I don't know Farsi, so I'm not, wasn't the best to research this, but I do know Russian, I do know Russian social networks and how pe the Russian internet and how it operates, so I knew where to go right away. So it, it depends on your local, um, your specific area studies knowledge. Um, and also just knowing um, kind of, you know, if, if I were a person living in this place, where would I go to share a photo or video? And you have to kind of innately know this and you can't just go to facebook.com and I just type it in, right? It, it doesn't work like that. So a lot of it just, um, it needs actual expertise and not just um, complete wide data, data mining. Yeah, so this is really interesting, Eric, and I think you've just given a perfect link to Richard, although mm -hmm. I don't know what Richard Guthrie is going to be talking about. I have talked to Richard about this sort of uh, 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 issue around how monitoring and tracking uh, often relies on uh, understanding the context of the thing that you're looking at. Uh, so thanks very much, Eric. Um, I'm going to hand over to Richard Guthrie now from CBW Events. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Henrietta. Um, uh, thank you for organising this, and um, and thank you to all those uh, also helping out, those visible and, and behind the scenes. Uh, I've only got a short time to speak, so I'll uh, dive straight in. Uh, the purpose of this presentation is to draw out some of the lessons from past uses of open source information, and as Henrietta said, context is key. Importantly, there are areas in which open source information enables clear assessments not only to evaluate a situation itself directly, but to enable effective assessments of the analyses made by others. This is the key point, that information always has a context, and not only does any particular piece of information need to be evaluated within its initial context, the context itself needs to be evaluated. Uh, this is where intelligence activities have often fallen short whether state-run and operating on closed information sources, or those outside of government analysing open source inputs. In the history of state intelligence operations in the realm of WMD, there are numerous times where insufficiently rigorous analysis has been done of the many individual pieces of information within their respective contexts, especially where the arena of information analysis rubs up against the arena of high-level politics. There are a number of clear examples, such as the US missile gap assessments of the late 1950s and early 1960s, the Soviet Operation Ryan analysis of when, not if, there would be a Western invasion, or the Western assessments of Soviet chemical weapons stocks in the 1980s. The one I will examine for this brief discussion will be the Yellow Rain allegations. I've chosen this example because the comparison between the analysis of the source information by the government making the allegations can be compared with the analysis by allied governments and with the analysis of non-governmental ana analysts at the time. Those non-governmental analysts were utilising open source information. Key amongst those open, uh, the, uh, 
Key amongst those non-governmental analysts were Matt Messelson of Harvard University and Julian Perry Robinson of Sussex University. Uh, Julian is sadly no longer with us, having succumbed to COVID-19 in April. Uh, I worked with both for many years, but the events I will be describing date from before my work with them. In the late 1970s, there were allegations of use of toxins produced by fungi or molds as weapons. Uh, these toxins, or broadly uh, the term for these toxins, is mycotoxins. It's important to note that a mycotoxin is a poisonous substance made by a living thing and therefore falls into the overlap between chemical and biological weapons. However, the international law in place at the time on the use of such weapons, the 1925 Geneva Protocol, covered the whole spectrum of lethal CBW. There's a key moment in the Yellow Rain allegations, 13th of September 1981, so, so 39 years ago uh, on Sunday. US Secretary of State Alexander Haig spoke in Berlin to the local press association. His words included, and I'll quote, for some time now, the international community has been alarmed by continuing reports that the Soviet Union and its allies have been using lethal chemical weapons in Laos, Kampuchea and Afghanistan. Uh, he went on to say, and I quote again, we have now found physical evidence from Southeast Asia, which has been analysed and found to contain abnormally high levels of three potent mycotoxins, poisonous substances not indigenous to the region and which are highly toxic to man and animals. End of quote. The timing was important. Haig was scheduled to meet Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko soon after. There was a lot of pressure on both countries to be making progress on arms control. The Haig announcement brought any prospect of moving forward on any forms of arms control agreement impossible in the near future. Indeed, if such allegations were true, there could be no such agreement. The physical evidence that Haig referred to took the form of samples of a yellowish powder. US official sources indicated that high levels of mycotoxins had been found in these samples, although it was later clarified that high levels had only been found in the analysis by one laboratory. When these samples were looked at under the microscope, they were found to be mostly composed of pollen. This immediately raised questions as to what role the pollen might play. Contemporary reporting indicated that an Australian government laboratory did not have confidence in the veracity of the samples that had been supplied by the US. That did not imply that the US itself had tampered with the samples as the US had acquired samples through a variety of routes. Contemporary accounts also indicated scepticism from the UK lab at Porton Down that the samples contained anything in types or quantities expected to cause illness in humans. This was confirmed in the UK Parliament by a Defence Minister in 1986, although he added the following caveat, and I quote again, the absence of positive results is not necessarily incompatible with positive findings from other samples. While our results are negative, the MOD's view is that, from epidemiological evidence, chemical warfare attacks probably did take place in Southeast Asia, although we cannot identify the chemical warfare agent, nor do we know who the supplier might be. End of quote. So what was the epidemiology? The first thing to note is that the local epidemiology details were sparse. Much of the epidemiological information was open and so carefully examined by non-governmental analysts. What information was available was inadequate to use as a baseline to understand the prevalence of relevant medical conditions that might naturally occur in the particular areas. Another major gap was a lack of useful information that could provide a time sequence that could relate the onset of relevant medical conditions with the appearance of the yellow powder spots on leaves that were the hallmark of the alleged attacks with yellow rain. This led to further epidemiological work by parts of the US government, but this effort failed to find convincing evidence in support of the allegations. There were other oddities in the claims. Closer examination of the pollen grains in yellow rain samples were shown to have been processed in some ways. The contents had been removed, leaving behind the protein husks. No clear explanation was given by those in support of the allegations of use as to why such processing was needed to make a weapon. All species of pollen identified in the samples were local to the area, but each yellow spot contained a different mix. If the spots in the same area had all been sprayed out of the same tank on the same aircraft, there would be an expectation of greater similarity between the spots. So perhaps the spots were each processed slightly differently from each other in some unknown way. 
So was there an alternative explanation? The processing of pollen was indistinguishable from the processes pollen undergoes in the digestive systems of many insects. Biologists were able to establish that, contrary to Haig's claims, the mycotoxins that have been detected were indeed indigenous. Moreover, they were identified in rotting materials such as insect droppings. In particular, one species of Fusarium fungus, the toxin of which the US had claimed as a yellow rain constituent, was shown specifically to be able to be grown on insect droppings. This line of thinking offered a simple explanation for the variations in pollen content for separate spots in the same area. If the spots were insect droppings, separate spots would be different as their composition relied on the selection of pollen each insect had ingested. But if these were insect droppings, surely local people would have seen the droppings being placed there by the insects. Thomas Seeley, a honeybee expert from Yale University, was able to show from open sources that the yellow rain samples were indistinguishable in particle size, colour and general appearance from the droppings of bees native to Southeast Asia. It turns out that these bees have very clean habits. Periodically they leave the hive collectively and as a swarm go to the toilet at a height of tens of metres and some distance from the hive. At the height they fly they are not visible from the ground. Thus the spots appear on the leaves from what on the ground appears to be an unknown source. The pieces of the puzzle therefore all fitted together and the conclusions could be drawn that yellow rain was not a Soviet toxin weapon but were a natural phenomenon of collective bee defecation. So what lessons can be drawn from this? The first is that understanding the context of all of the pieces of information was key. Distinguishing a deliberate event from a natural occurrence may require understanding the context from a variety of aspects. And many of those aspects have open source materials available for study. Uh, this is true, as an aside, this is true today to distinguish naturally occurring disease from deliberate acts. And so it was possible to use more recently developed techniques to have high confidence very early on that COVID-19 was not an example of a deliberate disease. In Yellow Rain, one of the key contexts examined was the question of what a real attack would look like. This could then be compared with the evidence on the ground, and indeed it did not match. So this is the key lesson from the Yellow Rain allegations. Are there credible alternative explanations for phenomena or evidence that is observed? There have been many cases from history where such credible alternative expl explanations to dubious claims can be derived from open sources and I, I'll leave it there since I'm just bumping up to my 10 minutes. Thank you, Henrietta. No, thank you, Richard. Really interesting and brings us, you know, that it feels like there's so much overlap in some of the things that are coming out of the three talks. Um, so it felt to me very much that what you were giving us, Richard, was a historical example of a slam dunk moment where non-governmental researchers showed an issue, demonstrated that a uh, interpretation uh, widely held was incorrect. <clears throat> and it feels not dissimilar to the examples that Jamie gave us from her work and Eric gave us from his work. Um, so my question to you, Richard, before I open it up to other people is, uh, I wonder if you could reflect on um, other contextual issues. Um, so you, you pointed out that in doing these sorts of analyses, context is very important and Eric mentioned similar trends that it was very important that he understood uh, the specifics of the Russian language and how social media is used in that particular local context and you, you pointed out similar even though the technology were different that you need to understand where the information has come from. Do you think it's also true to say that the context of how you write and how you disseminate the information is very important because I know that Julian Perry Robinson and Matt Messelson have had enormous impact in various decision making. Jamie mentioned that she was mindful of how, where and how she publishes things. And I wonder if you could reflect on the, the, the impact of the Yellow Rain study. Yes, that's a whole set of questions to unpack there, which probably be uh, um, several hours of seminars. Uh, but yes, the, the communication of what you found is key because you need to put the key contextual information there, but also 
it's a bringing together of the different areas from the the scientific and technical to the legal about you know what is it supposed to be in compliance with something to the political of you know what are the implications of certain results and you have to produce your information in such a way that people who are primarily only comfortable in one or of those areas say a scientist or a political figure can understand the implications of what you found in all of those other areas and that can be extremely difficult because you know in summarizing things you can add incoherence you can add, you know shortening a store shortening a narrative in order to make it more understandable can potentially uh, lose some key information but it is really very important to look back at something like yellow rain and to realize that you know in all of the discussions that have been held since on things like investigating unusual outbreaks of disease the lessons have been learned uh, to an extent from uh, the the yellow rain work uh, and that has been really impressive for a group of non-governmental people to have uh, such an influence on governmental processes uh, and it, it's very sad to me sometimes that those things are forgotten because one of the interesting things about the story of chemical and biological weapons is the real success that there has been is in reducing their salience, reducing their usefulness on the international stage as symbols of power. And we've now moved forward some decades um, and people coming into the field now assume these things have much less significance because that reduction in salience has been successful. But actually there's some really key lessons from the chemical and biological areas that are really important for global security issues now. Uh, that's very interesting, isn't it? Because that opens up a whole other set of things about the potential for detecting, uh, illicit or dubious artifacts might the, the the work monitoring it might feed into actual narratives for how the world thinks about them um, so thank you um, i'm going to start asking some questions of the whole panel we've got about uh, uh, five to six minutes <laughs> sorry before i'm going to uh, let people go at three and leave the uh, leave the space open for an optional 30 minutes of informal chat um, I've learned such a lot from all three projects um, and I think this, this sense of the specificity of information is key uh, to, to lots of what you've been talking about. Eric, I'm going to start with you um, because um, uh, Alan Hill um, has uh, posted a comment for you. Uh, he mm -hmm. says, collecting the information as soon as possible is critical mm -hmm. before it is taken down or removed, which maybe connects to something I was thinking about when you were talking about what vulnerabilities are there mm -hmm. in relying on user-generated mm -hmm. content? Uh, yeah, I'll leave it to you. Yeah. yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, there's always vulnerabilities because user-generated content, um, at least it's often seen as inherently less reliable than other forms of information, which I mean, I guess the other forms would be things like government provided or anonymous source and things like that. But um, often I think user-generated content is, I mean, it's just as reliable, if not more so than other forms, just because, um, it's the verification process for it. Again, this is a week long webinar on its own, but the verification process for um, verifying photographs and videos about, um, like Jamie mentioned earlier about geolocation, about determining the location of a photo or video. But that process is not super complicated. It, I mean, it's not a binary, it's often not a binary yes, no, verified, not verified, but you can definitely get to deg degrees of confidence that are, that are practically a binary yes, no. Um, and uh, but once you can once you go through the verification process to determine the originality of a uh, piece of um, content, its location and the time it was taken, then I mean then it's contextualized and you can then use it for whatever. So I mean a lot of times this is pretty cut and dry. If you have multiple photos and videos from multiple sources showing the same military convoy, then you have a pretty good idea that it's that it's real, unless you have the the greatest uh, psyop of all time with all these different you know people like fabricating this fake thing. I mean that doesn't that doesn't happen. Um, though some people say the CIA maybe is competent enough for that, but I don't think they are. Um, so yeah, but the retention of information is, is a tricky thing though, because it, there's different levels of um, types of retention uncertainty. 
So if you're trying to main, um, retain information that can be, then be used in something like the International Criminal Court, the standards for evidence are much higher than if you're just publishing an investigation on, um, you know, on Bellingcat or a news website or something else, um, because it has to go through legal standards that can be vetted through, you know, that the prosecution or defense team can then go through as well. And there are methods for this. Um, the Human Rights Center at UC Berkeley, they're kind of, um, they're kind of on the cutting edge for a lot of the stuff about setting standards and methodologies and stuff for this retention of evidence for things like um, criminal prosecutions and, and the ICC and things like that. Um, and I know a lot of other institutions, the ICC, obviously I mentioned earlier, the UN, um, places like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, they're also um, trying to set, um, create methodologies and like common practices for this um, practice. Um, so, I mean, yeah, so it's not just as simple as just like doing a screenshot, right? Because doing a screenshot is like the crudest and most unreliable form of retention of a photo or video. But you also have to be able to archive um, and maintain in the highest resolution and keep, you know, put on something, a third party archive site like the archive.org or um, archive.today, uh, the metadata and so on that can be maintained from the original upload. So it's a complicated question that is uh, often more in the legal realm than the investigative realm. But um, depending on exactly what your goal is with maintaining or doing your investigation, whether it's just shed light on something with, with um, you know, a report you publish versus, you know, get them thrown in the clink, right? <laughs> but with this as the evidence for it, uh, you'll have different practices for um, archiving and data retention. Uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, so um, with all of these things, like you've said many times, I feel that we could talk for much longer about all of them. Um, I think what you've done, I'm, go I'm going to give Jamie and Richard both a chance to comment on, on, on these things before we get to three. Uh, we'll just one minute each. Sorry, guys. Um, so, Eric, you mentioned that there's work, uh, and, and of course, you're very welcome to stay. Um, but, Eric, you mentioned there's work going on to think about common standards of evidence, where you set the bar for what counts. And I think that links really neatly to what Jamie said earlier. Um, about that the more this work increases, the more pressure there is to develop standard uh, practices, uh, kind of codes of conduct almost. I don't know that there's obviously uh, different loaded ways of saying that. So I want to, I'm, I'm interested to know if Jamie and Richard would like to reflect any more on that uh, and then we'll slow down again after three. Yes. <laughs> Jamie, would you like to say anything? Yeah, absolutely. So, um... I think um, Eric mentioned it in his speech as well on like, the democratization of data, right? So as more people gain access to the field, which I believe will continue to occur as technology and you know access continues to improve, there's simply going to be more data and more people conducting data analysis on these types of open source information. And so particularly when it's on you know items of national security, um, including non-proliferation, it is in important that people aren't kind of going with their first gut instinct and saying that something is something when it's not that. So for example, like I remember one time I was looking at a factory in China and I was convinced they were uh, producing a chemical, but then I went on Baidu, which is a Chinese like na navigation thing, and it was actually a furniture factory. And so kind of making sure and like verifying and understanding that there's space to be wrong and that people are going to inevitably be wrong at times is really important to a better kind of you know i think assessing those processes and making sure that uh as people say things that they are verified going back to that question of verification so i think that a kind of a due diligence or a set methodology or some sort of kind of code of behavior particularly as it relates to national security interests so as to curb misinformation and disinformation um, will be incredibly valuable as you know data continues its democratization. Yeah thank you very interesting and makes perfect sense I like that phrase it's important to have the space to be wrong and it makes me wonder if this isn't something that open source non-governmental stuff can really contribute uh, to, to higher level policy making processes um, if we had longer, Jamie, and if you are staying after three o'clock, I'd be interested to talk to you um, about, uh, at a different time, um, about the democratisation of data, because it seems to me that's another vulnerability point, because that's very patchy, how that's going, and there's this kind of splitting up of different systems, so that maybe open source stuff will need to accommodate a whole bunch of different practices, and it might get harder. Yeah, thank you. Um, Richard, I'm going to invite you to, to say something quickly. Uh, uh. 
Some say quickly, yes. Um, yes. Yeah, I'll just Sorry. follow up with a few points. Um, yeah, th I mean, that last point by Jamie, really important. I mean, it's like learning a new musical instrument. You know, you, you can't be a virtuoso uh, the first time you pick up an instrument, and there has to be a space by which people can almost say, I'm sort of playing around with this, I'm rehearsing this, and not people going, well, you can't play that instrument properly yet. That's really important. Uh, just a couple of very quick sort of bullet points. I mean, one of the things that's really important that hasn't properly come out, but this... Uh, democratization of information we we have a spectrum of it's hard to find the right terminology from what you might call serious analysts who are trying very carefully uh, to to gather information that they can be rigorous with to what one might call the the more conspiracy nut I've picked out one piece of information out of context and making a claim on it and really what is needed in the world is to push people up that spectrum towards the more rigorous analysis and then two very quick final points I mean one of the key things that's come out actually I think of all the uh, the statements is that you have to know the ordinary in order to understand what is out of the ordinary it's this contextual point but the the Jamie and Eric both drew on on points where they were showing some distinction and the second is about the last one is about false information uh, one of the earliest th things I had as a task in my career was to try and see whether the um, newly agreed conventional armed forces in Europe treaty verification arrangements could be spoofed could people hide key bits of military equipment um, under the verification arrangements and the best sources I had in chatting with people to work out ways of potentially doing it were magicians and their life is about creating a false presentation of things to hide some other aspect and there is a lot we can still learn from those sorts of groups of people to work out when we're looking at a picture are there things that could be hidden behind that somebody is trying to misdirect us or mislead us on uh, thank you, Richard. Yes, uh, fantastic points. It's sort of hidden in plain sight or hidden in hidden sight. Uh, very interesting. So it's now two minutes past three. Um, when we originally planned this, we thought about uh, an hour's worth of presentations, but in our last webinars, people wanted longer to talk about the issues. So I invite anybody that needs to leave uh, to, to leave now. Um, and then I'm going to start uh, talking just briefly about some things that I've learned and, and maybe get some conversations going on that stage. And just to say, there's no pressure <laughs> from audience, uh, from participants to kind of have any sense that these are well-formed questions. I think we're really interested uh, in exploring um, all sorts of different thoughts people have about this area. Um, so what I've learned today from three excellent presentations is a sense that it's really important to be careful about how you do use the language. Uh, it became evident in pre-meeting chat that I was using the words methodologies and tools rather unspecifically uh, and uh, not carefully enough. And Jamie, you, you really helped by, by clarifying uh, that. Uh, I've also got this sense of um, the possibilities for non-governmental tracking through publicly available information can demonstrate all sorts of things uh, which can, as Richard said, kind of feed through into political processes. And as we found out in previous webinars and in Eric and Jamie's examples, it can also just help empower um, other processes domestically uh, or internationally. Um, I think it was very interesting to me throughout um, the, the three, three talks, there's this kind of potential invitation, as I, as I sort of outlined uh, in, in my opening statements, there's this, there's this question mark about the extent to which these activities might be joined up or could be joined up if it's even desirable <laughs> to think about joining up. So I recognise completely that having lots of independent activity uh, distributed in different places can be enormously beneficial because it gives a range of flexible tools. It gives the sort of peer review processes that Jamie outlined are very helpful. Eric mentioned also that it can be very helpful to have redundancies in where you get data from and in numbers of people looking at that same data. So, that, so given the benefits of having individual uh, uh, independent projects, is it helpful to think about joining up? Um, and if it were helpful to think about joining up, what does that look like? Is there a sense of thinking about um, 
collective uh, understanding about uh, Eric and Jamie both given kind of indications about this, but indications about the what evidence uh, people count, what levels of authentication count around the world, so that in Richard's analysis, this sort of spectrum of different uses, if you have some agreed standards, it's easier for people to understand what they're seeing. So I'm opening that out to anybody that um, would like to um, to comment any more on that. Uh, any of the speakers, if you if you've got any more to say, uh, uh, please do jump up. Nothing for me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, Jamie or Richard, do you have anything to say about the possibilities of joining up? If there's something you'd like to see happen or not see happen. I think um, specifically in the non-proliferation realm, data set collection and data set creation is going to be incredibly important. And so in order to kind of apply these, you know, emerging technology, artificial intelligence, data analysis kind of applications, um, you need big data sets. And the thing about working in non-proliferation is that oftentimes a lot of these data sets aren't publicly available. And that, because that can be useful for non-proliferation in that, you know, we don't have large amounts of information about WMDs just floating around. However, in order to kind of improve analysis, it would be beneficial to kind of have better data sets. And so I think partnership to an extent in kind of data sharing and data like crowdsourcing and collaboration um, is super beneficial, but it is also important to kind of remember like not everybody's going to have the same goals in their research. And so kind of understanding those underlying uh, motivations for potentially conducting research on a non-proliferation related area of interest is incredibly important to like uh, keep in mind as you kind of continue to develop those partnerships. So understanding kind of motivations behind why someone might be doing that research, I think is incredibly valuable. Um, and I just wanted to also, this is kind of unrelated, um, but going back to Eric's earlier point on, you know, crowdsourcing and publicly available or user generated data, um, as opposed to state generated data. So like I, I focus mainly on North Korea and our main data sets for North Korea um, are uh, North Korea state media, which is a lot of propaganda. And so kind of going through that and it's kind of the opposite of uh, Eric's problem where I have very minimal information, but it's information that North Korea wants me to see. And so I kind of have to ask myself, why do they want me to see this? Or what do they want me to kind of uh, gather from this? And so that's, I think, an important distinction to make too, is that sometimes the available information isn't necessarily just like, hey, I saw this cool thing, but it's rather, it's, it's pretty targeted. So understanding, again, that um, uh, origins of, and those motivations behind that information and, you know, potential interest in research um, uh, is important. Great. And that kind of brings us back to this sense of context of the data that you generate is very important. And maybe there's a sort of uh, 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 idea that anybody can do this. If you have the internet and you have the right stuff, you could do this, but actually it's more finely tuned than that. To do it well, you need to have, you need to be embedded uh, in what you're looking at. Eric mentioned that over time you develop a sixth sense about things that are going to be useful and, and that, that can't happen except without some effort. I'm really interested by that point, Jamie, that uh, not everybody has the same goals or expectations um, or I think I put this word in your mouth, values, when they're doing the uh, open source analysis. And that's also true of the people that are putting out the data, that there might be different values loaded in there. Do you, does any, do any of the panelists or anybody see any conflicts between, uh, between some of those things? So if your goal is greater transparency in, uh, in, in building uh, different uh, systems for, for regulating things, uh, does that conflict with ideas about privacy uh, or ownership of information? Um, uh, are there, uh, and so that's just within one person, I can see there might be a conflict there, um, but between uh, states that may be interested in developing regulations, would there be conflicts between people's understanding of verification or the benefits of transparency? Um, it feels as though, uh, uh, there are different understandings of what verifi ver verification can or should be doing. 
Um, so I don't know if anybody would like to come in on that. Yeah. Yeah, I would. If uh, I mean, there is, you know, and it's not just about individual privacy. It's about what what does it mean for security. When I was uh, working with Vertic in the nineteen nineties, uh, I had three three rules for verification. The second of which was that the the greater transparency should enhance security and not diminish it. Uh, because simply having transparency in another side's military operations may actually cause uh, weaknesses that people will then want to attempt to exploit. And so you make the situation more, more dangerous. Uh, so there are some really key um, aspects to that. So you have to test what it is that the information is being exchanged. Uh, and Jamie made the point about not making a shopping list. I mean, uh, one of the things that I've got to be very careful on in some of the work I do is that in, in under unpinning some of the history of chemical and biological weapons programs when you're trying to illustrate now things to look out for for potential proliferation because i do things like train export control officers from different countries around the world you don't want to give away too much information that allows people um, to make their own weapons and here's the difficulty. People go, oh, this information is 50 years old. And I go, yeah, but this information about how to disseminate this material 50 years ago is still bloody effective. So pardon my language, if somebody used it today. Uh, there's another thing about exchange of information that is really important, which you haven't quite touched on. And that is about the assumptions that individuals can make. And we're all prone to it. I mean, one of the, in looking at the Syrian chemical weapons program, one of the assumptions most Western analysts make is an assumption that the Syrian perspective on the utility of chemical weapons is the same as the perspective they talk about in terms of Western powers. And indeed, there are some similarities, but it's also clear when you can try and go through some of the information, you, try, you speak to people who left Syria, and I, I did interview a number of Syrian opposition figures uh, at the beginning of the war, people who'd left before the civil war had really broken out, and their assumptions of the both military and political utility of chemical weapons were very different from what a lot of Western analysts have. And so that's really important to exchange information, exchange analysis, so that somebody else might go, well, have you made an assumption here? How do you know that what you've got from your experience actually relates to the experiences of the people who are doing this action or preparing this material or, or organizing this production site? because I think that can really make uh, a difference to the integrity of your analysis. You have to be open to challenge because all of these things are subject to some uncertainty, to some cultural backgrounds, to some political backgrounds, to some financial backgrounds, uh, you know, the available resources to do something. And so corners are cut from what people expect to happen. Um, you know, that's, that's a really important lesson of the Iraqi chemical weapons program. People said, oh, we will know that they're doing certain things because we'll see the protective kit that people are using to make or to produce certain materials. And actually their health and safety standards were just so different from people who've been involved in producing chemical weapons in the West and in the Soviet Union. Uh, so those key assumptions, you, have to, you just have to be ready to be challenged on them. That's very interesting. Um, it feels to me, again, you've kind of identified something that open source uh, research done by non-governmental groups might find easier than negotiated verification regimes and nobody right back in the first webinar there's always been a sense that this stuff can't replace big structures big international treaties but there are there is scope for thinking it could support them um and yes yes mm. sorry can i just follow up on that i mean yeah. and that's there's a very key point there i mean my if i have an ambition it's that chemical and biological weapons are possible to be used. Now, there are a range of governance areas here. Now, here's the key measure of success, that the damn things aren't used. The second measure of success is that nobody has them. You know, that's a sl slightly lower down the hierarchy. But the key thing is, does it matter whether the cause of that success is an international legal instrument by the adoption of cultural norms, by accepted levels of behavior, in a sense, I mean, I think uh, Sveri Lodgaard, uh, Norwegian, once said it doesn't matter how the norms are constituted if the norms are followed, or words to that effect. I think he phrased it a slightly different way. And actually, 
in, in stopping what we might call bad behavior, certainly in the chemical and biological field, it's about this collective set of actions, not just international legal instruments, for which perhaps you can specify a level of compliance with, but other norms, other aspects of behavior, where some of those compliance questions are a little bit more vague, how do you evaluate those? Uh, and that raises a whole set of questions, but if you've got people looking at that more cultural level, I think it reinforces the international legal instruments. Yes, I would agree, and I'd be very interested in what Jamie and Eric said about that. I do wonder if it once again comes back to Jamie's feeling that the more it happens, the more it's important that people are following uh, certain standards uh, there. I, I have a question from Tom Hickey um, saying, can anybody recommend good books or courses or guides on OSINT techniques or methodologies? Um, yeah. I don't know if anybody wants to answer that immediately. Um, uh, Jamie, did it look like you were? Yeah, yeah. yeah, um, I can. yeah. Oh, sorry. I'll go after you, sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay, no worries. Um, well, I was going to point them to Bellingcat too, so I'll, <laughs> I'll let you speak on that. But, um, <laughs> Um, OSINT Techniques and Methodologies by uh, Basil, or B-A-Z-Z-E-L, um, it's fantastic. And so uh, that's my kind of one go-to textbook on it. Um, my organization, the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies, also does a lot of more OSINT uh, publication work focusing on satellite imagery. Um, we partner with the Nuclear Threat Initiative or NTI um, on nti.org and they, we have some fantastic case studies on how to better use um, satellite imagery, menstruation, that kind of thing. So um, check those out. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. You, sorry, I was a little bit late because I was actually grabbing my copy of Bizzell's book for those behind me. So, yeah, this is, it's a good, it's like 40 bucks on Amazon. I promise we're not getting sponsorship money for this. Um, it's a, he really re releases it every year. It's a really good um, um, desk material, like literal desk reference guy I actually had it on my desk behind me. Um, and it's about five, 600 pages. Um, and it's really good. It's just kind of a good, it's like, it's not the most comprehensive one, but it's probably the most, um, broad, right? It kind of, it's a very, it's as wide as an ocean, uh, not quite deep as a puddle, but a little bit deeper. And uh, also I, I put into the chat, um, we have a Google Doc that we have, that we keep up. It's a little bit out of date, but it's mostly good. Bit.ly, this is the short link, bit.ly slash bcat dash tools. I have it in the chat if everyone wants to see it. This is direct links to a Google, um, a Google Doc that we keep. It's 20, 30 pages of different tools and um, sites that you can use for whatever purpose. So it has like the uh, image verification part. It has like the who is data part. It has like the, um, I don't know, what is the other one? It's like a data visualization section, all those. So we keep this up. It's crowdsourced. Um, if you open it up, you'll see there's always about 60, 70 people who have it open in a tab. Um, just bookmark it, keep it, you know, if, you, if you're if you looking for a particular topic, like, and I want to track this plane or this um, this uh, naval vessel, but I have no idea where to start, this is a good kind of um, an overview of different tools that are available. And also we mark on there if it, if it costs any money, because half of these cost money, um, a very, you know, varying between like a $5 subscription versus a like $5,000 license. Um, so, yep, I, I, again, I double Michael Bazell's book. Um, the seventh edition is out right now. It's 40 bucks on Amazon. Um, and also the um, toolkit that we have on Google Docs. Thank you, uh, and, and some really top te uh, tips. Um, on a sort of uh, related, um, but slightly cheeky question, if you were a novice in this area and you were browsing courses, we've, we've got your definite recommendations now, but I'm aware there's hundreds of courses out there. Are there any red flags that people should avoid? Uh, yeah, um, I, I'll answer this one. Um, I'm gonna, um, not give too many recommendations yes because bellingcat we run training courses yes. so i'm going to yeah. step back and not recommend our own our own <laughs> no but jamie's um, but, already recommended you so that's okay, okay good okay yeah. great but well, we do offer <laughs> courses it's a few hundred dollars for webinars yeah um but don't uh don't spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for a course um unless it's like at an actual university over a whole semester um i'm trying to very specifically not to trash anybody but if you spend you know thousands and thousands of dollars on a single course, um, you probably are getting, you're spending too much money just because almost all of the investigator techniques that you can learn how to do are freely available and there's guides and extensive guides and stuff available. So we have a bunch of um, free, uh, everything on Bellingcat's free, free guides, case studies, walkthroughs, all that that we put down already. Um, and, but I would, re I would really, really recommend um, 
just trying to find a niche that you're especially interested in, uh, whatever whatever this is. So it's North Korean weapon development or you know, investigation to the war in the Donbass with different information environments, whatever you're, whatever you're interested in, because whatever it is, there's probably a community of people already investigating it. And they're probably on Twitter because um, that's kind of, that's kind of the main gathering place for this sort of stuff. Some people are in like Reddit, some people are in discords, there are other few places too. Um, but um, st stop and don't spend an ungodly amount of money. Like don't spend like three months of rent on a um, investigative course uh, without trying to make sure that the same content is not available for free. And I say this as somebody, you know, Bell Cat, like a big part of our budget is offering these online and in-person webinars. So I'm, I, maybe I'm going against our own, <laughs> our own business model, um, but just make sure that you know what you're getting out of it. Um, because a lot of the stuff that is offered for money is also offered up or free. And if you can, and if you do want to pay for one, um, have your, um, see if you can get your employer to do it. Because a lot of people, um, if you're paying out of your own bank account, uh, think really hard, but if you can get your employer to pay for it, then all the better. Then, then all the caveats go away and you should definitely sign up <laughs> if your boss will pay for it. Yeah. Thank you, Ari. That's really helpful. And I think that's a really good steer for anybody who wants to uh, get involved that they should start with some free stuff. Um, so I'm going to come back to uh, the the uh, main body of the some of the things that you've talked to uh, me about. So Eric and Jamie, your live projects. Uh, I'm really interested to find out from you about what counts as success. Um, so if, if if that's a meaningful question in any way. So Richard gave a, an example of a non-governmental project that fed into different systems. We've had an example from. Uh, well, various examples over the webinars of things resulting in court, court cases, but do you have a single notion of success? And if so, what is it? I have the standard non-proliferation answer, which is success for me every day is a day that a nuclear weapon doesn't go off, right? Um, so that's a very, very basic uh, answer. But getting more into specific like OSINT successes, um, I think I used to be like, oh, if I find this North Korean missile or this tunnel entry, like that'll be a success. But now more so it's, I'm less looking at the really <laughs> exciting things like that. And more so at, hey, this building is cool. No one's talked about it before. Do other people in my North Korea watcher community, do they also think it's cool? And if the answer to that is yes, and I'm able to explore it more and kind of come up with you know, new hypotheses that maybe haven't been considered before, I count that as a success. So um, again, it's not like me making mind shattering observations every single day, but rather it's a, I'm slowly making progress and slowly uncovering things that maybe haven't been talked about in this, you know, field. As a so, so that sounds fantastic to me. That sounds, you know, you're doing it for the world, <laughs> you know, there's a sort of, you're providing visibility, but uh, just to bring it back to earlier in your presentation, there was a sense that you, you think very carefully about where you publish and what you publish. Who would you ideally like to read uh, your publications and what would you like them to do? And again, maybe this is a, an answerable question. I'm not sure. Sure. So I think my, my goal is for like people who are reading my stuff are people who are making legislation or making you know the more formal arms control agreements and non-proliferation agreements or treaties or resolutions um, and so ideally if i can get them to read something and say or understand that it's potentially a concern or a pattern of behavior that might turn into a concern um and then they're able to you know apply more diplomatic pressure more like international kind of uh, have larger consequences than I alone can have as a researcher at an NGO. Um, and so I think that that's kind of ultimately my goal is to get those um, others interested and curious about the work. Right. So very interesting. Again, this sort of joined up with the things, sort of things that Richard was saying. Uh, and from that point of view, again, this may be could be part of a conversation of joining up because uh, from the things that everybody's mentioned, there's a complexity about understanding results from OSINT data. And if there are a community of researchers able to communicate that uh, collectively, uh, or, or uh, I know Richard and I in the past have talked about training diplomats or decision makers in, in how to understand information properly, uh, that, that might feature into ideas of an emerging discipline or set of practices. Yeah. Eric, do you want to uh, come in on what counts as success for you? Sure. 
Yep, there's a couple. I mean, it depends on the exact um, <clears throat> investigation or project or whatever, but I think there's two. One thing that um, should not be underestimated is there's a certain, especially with um, online investigation, there's a certain like gamification almost to this to this work because uh, a lot of the work we do, um, I mean, when you're hunting for, um, you know, missile uh, missiles and things like that, the stakes are a little bit higher, right? <laughs> with, um, you know, preventing a nuclear strike or whatever. Um, but a lot of the work that we do is a little bit more, um, a lot lower stakes um, and has a little bit more of a crowdsource and community element to it. So even with very, very serious things like the downing of the Iranian, um, of the Ukrainian airliner mentioned earlier over Tehran, there was an element of gamification to that to where you had everyone on Twitter who was at simultaneously trying to find um, content around this and for the videos and photos that were found, trying to locate exactly where they were taken, recreating the flight path, all that stuff. Um, and it was almost competitive to a degree. So, I mean, there, when you talk about incentives about this, I think that's something that can be underestimated is that um, the, the work that's being done for these large events is not all just being done by a single journalistic entity or a portal or whatever, it's, it's done um, over a large um, spread about people, you know, random people who just are enthusiasts or amateurs or whatever. And often they're the ones who find the most interesting stuff. And also I think that um, going off the point you said earlier, a lot of the work that we do um, at Bellingcat, the stuff we publish is very methodologically focused, very focused on methodology and process. And so we care more about, like we bear the process as, as, um, as nakedly as we can to showing, you know, what the steps are and how the sausage is made and all the other bad metaphors for this. Um, about how we how we reached the conclusion, and we care often more about showing the methodology and exactly how what our steps we took more than the actual result. And we'll sometimes publish investigations that are incomplete. Right? We'll have an investigation that actually never found the conclusion we want and never got to the never got from point A to point B. And so then the New York Times or BBC would never get published because you know why are you reading this? this is an incomplete investigation? You never found what you're looking for. But we'll still post this just to delay bear the process. I'm like, okay, this is the methodology and this is the process. These are where the missteps were. These are where, you know, um, if, if we did succeed, this is where it would have been found, right? This is the process that would have been found. So for us, often the the a success is not just, you know, we figured it out and we solved it and, you know, we identified, you know, the bad guy or whatever, but also showing what the process is in a very clear and interesting way. So other people who are journalists or amateurs or human rights investigators or whoever they are, um, will be able to learn from the process and make it a more of a pedagogical investigation than a results-based investigation. Great, thank you. So you've given us a, a different sense there about part of Bellingcat's rationale is the sort of uh, fundamental science, how to do this, what counts as sure. good work. Uh, mm -hmm. This is how you could do your own thing. So that's, that's yet another spin. Um, uh, very, very interesting, uh, different, uh, this word gamification, yes, I think it's come up before, this sense that it becomes a treasure hunt, uh, that you're uh, motivating a whole bunch of people around the world, uh, is very interesting. Um, we're running out of time again, um, so <laughs> thank you. Richard, would you like to come in for some final comments and then I'll- Yeah, that was, I was just to follow up, I mean, it was fascinating, almost the cultural assumptions of these, the previous speakers on, on measures of success. Um, I talked about the verification, three rules of verification I used to have in the 1990s. The third one was a good verification system should be cheap to comply with, but expensive to cheat under. And actually one of the things I see about open source stuff is that by being able to illustrate bad behavior or behavior that's considered bad by someone, you actually make it more expensive and more difficult for some of these people to do it because they end up having to take on extra effort to avoid what you you see and that that to me is a, a really core cool reason for doing some of these things uh, and, uh, and just a last quick comment about the training um in some ways it's not even good training is not even about the open source information handling open source information itself it's about understanding the context I and mean, if we just take jamie's work and the team at monterey's work when they identify development in north korea it is not simply that they can handle high quality imagery, it is because they can put that image into context. And that's the really important point to me. And so if you decide, you know, anybody in this seminar uh, that you have an interest in a particular area, actually understanding the context of that area and identifying questions that might be raised and inconsistencies in policies or activities that people have to do to carry out some policy you are disagreeing with 
At that point, once you've identified the question, she then also helps you to identify what might be the sorts of tools you want to seek out to be able to answer the questions raised by those inconsistencies. Right, yes, yeah, right. Absolutely interesting. I've just had a message saying we're about to be booted out. <laughs> so um, we could go on for much longer. I know that everybody's got lives though as well, so it's not a bad thing really. So thank you to all the panellists, to Jamie Withorn, to Eric Toller and to Richard Guthrie. Thank you to everybody who's come here. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to Dan's last question. I think our session's timed out, but we will start with that one um, about uh, 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 different ways to think about scaling up. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. See you soon. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye, guys.